Welcome to Ask the CIO, brought to you by Learning Tree International. And now, here's your host, Jason Miller. My special guest today is David Bray, the Federal Communication Commission's Chief Information Officer. David, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Jason. Let's start with the, at the beginning, if you will. You are kind of new to the FCC. You've been here about maybe a few months, two or three months. Give me some background. How did you end up at the FCC? Where else have you worked inside, out of government during your career? I came previously from what was called the National Commission for the Review of the Research and Development Programs of the U.S. Intelligence Community. That was a two-year commission that was looking across all the R&D efforts of the U.S. Intelligence Community. It was 12 commissioners, bipartisan, and so I guess I said I, I went from having 12 commissioners to having five commissioners at the FCC, and I'm particularly interested at the FCC because one of the things that we saw when we did our review is the, the cybersecurity landscape, in particular for our country, is so much in the public and private sector that even if we do all the defense that we need to do on the government side, if we don't think about the public sector and the private sector, we're going to be missing a huge gap. And I've always been an advocate, and in fact, this goes back to 2006, 2007, when I was doing my dissertation research, that we can have privacy, we can have civil liberties, and we can have security. It's not an either or, it's actually all three. And so I'd like to try and make help that happen. Did you end up at FCC because they had a CIO job and you applied, or did someone recruit you? Uh, sometimes you find interesting stories about how people end up where they end up, kind of you know, by accident sometimes, sometimes on purpose. Actually, I'm proud to say all my uh, jobs, I've actually gone through USA Jobs. I go through the process. And actually, you asked about my background. I started, actually, believe it or not, when I was 15. I had to actually get a work permit, and that was actually uh, sort of working as a fellow at a Department of Energy facility. Then at 17, I actually got security clearance, which was fun because they said, well, what have you done since you were 18? And I was like, I'm not 18 yet. They said, okay, what do you do in the last six months? And so I've been in and out of government in different roles, Department of Defense, Center of Disease Control, Bioterrorism Program. But I think the common sort of thread for me is a clear sense of mission. And while the United States doesn't have a Department of Information, I don't think it necessarily should, if you think about it, our future really is communications. And so that's why I came to the FCC. Very good. One of the things about coming to the FCC, it's a new agency for you in many respects. What kind of learning curve are you seeing? How big is it? And how are you trying to shorten it? Are you going out and meeting with people? G give me a sense of, of what you're doing to kind of learn the business of the FCC. That's great. And actually, I'm a big believer of one should always seek to understand before they seek to be understood. Uh, and so from day one, even, even before I showed up, I said, I, I know I've got a lot of listening and learning to do. I know I've got blind spots. I actually reward people that point out my blind spots. And so within the first week, actually, one of the things I did was I actually invited all the bureaus and office chiefs. We have about 18 bureaus and offices. FCC itself is about, I guess at the time of the last shutdown, was 1,758 people. And so it's a small agency, independent agency, but it does have a lot of different organizational units. So I invited them all to have lunch, and basically I brought in lunch from like 1130 to 1 and said, I'd like to hear your thoughts. And basically... My goal was, through Socratic methods, sort of ask questions that would help inform me more. Uh, I've done the same thing with the team, also brought lunch in. team knows I have open-door policies uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but they can also come by any other time, too, if they can find me. That's a trick. I think one should definitely, within the first 60 and 90 days, assume that there's a lot of things you don't know and try and encourage and reward those that can point out the things you don't know. It's interesting you talk about rewarding the blind spots, and that's something that a lot of people aren't comfortable with because it's basically someone pointing out that, hey, you're not that smart in whatever area this is. Is it a reward of, like, you know, chocolate or, or donuts? What, what do you do? Um, no, so depending on what it is, uh, I do have chocolates. I actually brought back some chocolates for folks. I also try, for those that really do point out the big blind spots, try and recognize them with either we do, like, digital badges, much like gamification, trying to do points, um, and also just sort of giving kudos in when we have a team meeting. Uh, but really, I feel like it's necessary because, one, there is a history to the FCC. We date back to 1934. There obviously have been a lot of things that came before me. 40% of our IT systems are more than 10 years old, so that's important to know. And... I think specifically in technology, anyone who thinks they know everything just smacks of hubris. You have to recognize you don't know everything, but that's okay. There's actually a wonderful Harvard Business School report that actually says, in praise of the incomplete leader, that we create this myth that leaders should know everything, when in fact by opening themselves up and actually saying to the people around them, I'm only as good as what you all know too, then you actually sort of create a better leader. And so that's sort of my goal is to actually say, I know I don't know everything, I do know some things, and I can try and work with you to try and improve things, but point out where I'm missing things and where I can help nudge. Let's talk about your role as a CIO a little bit. How do you support the FCC's mission? You seem like a big strategy guy, but you probably also have some operations side that you have to kind of get inside and get your hands dirty a little bit. Yes, and in fact, I like you know, you're, very, you're very true, Jason, that we do have to get our hands dirty, and in fact, there's a lot of work to do here. My assessment is that our workforce relative to the size of other 
IT workforce for similar independent agencies, we're operating at about half or one-third strength. We've lost some government folks. Equally, our budget has, over time, not necessarily kept up with where it needed to go, and that's part of the sort of the challenges in terms of sequestration, but also just for FCC, you would think it would be a more leader in IT. It's been left to deteriorate. And so, of course, sequestration and shutdown is a great time to try and recruit new people and, and try and make things happen. Um, I'm sort of presenting the new figures to the new group that's coming in to sort of say, well, where do we want to go with this? And in terms of the staff, I think the challenge is, again, like I said, we have 40 percent, we have over 200 systems, again, for an agency of only about 1,758 people. That's part of our legacy. In the future, I'd like to go to more modular design, so that instead of creating new systems, we create modules that are interchangeable across systems, and so it's, it's a lot easier to manage and scale. With the team, I need to try and encourage them to, to get out of always fighting fires. And part of that is just basically going out and being able to, if we can, we'll see if that happens under any sequestration, uh, have additional people. Because, again, our workforce is about one half, one third of what it is relative to other agencies. And so that's why even if you have the greatest people in the world, which I think we do, I think we have a really stellar team, they're going to have burnout if we're not careful. Do you have a sense of why your staff is smaller compared to other agencies? Is it just a retirement wave? You had a bunch of people retirement, hiring freezes because of budget cut sequestration? Or was it just you depended on contractors too much? And as you come in, you're looking at going, I'm going to change the ratio. That's a good question. And, and, and I'm still listening and learning. But my assessment is FCC was very focused externally with the IT revolution that happened in the 1990s and the, two, and the, the 2000s period it didn't necessarily recognize the IT revolution that had to happen internally as well. From what I can tell, listening to people is, in the past, in the 1990s, there was distributed IT that each of the different bureaus and offices had their own IT shop. The trouble with that is you had some duplication of effort. And so in the early uh, 2000 period, they tried to centralize it, which ran the risk of estranging the bureaus and offices from actually doing IT. And so they're sort of now at this interesting nexus of how do we re- rebuild trust? And in fact, what I try and encourage uh, the team to do is the idea that we need to have, we need to demonstrate on a daily basis benevolence, competence, and integrity in terms of everything we do, and that we're actually here to partner with the bureaus and offices. I'm actually pitching the idea that we need to have what I call intrapreneurs, uh, so they're sort of entrepreneurs but on the inside, that are empowered. You know, they essentially have sort of this wide scope that they can actually work the bureau and offices to get their needs met within the budget limitations we have. And so I don't have to do central planning because I'm not a big fan of central planning and I don't have enough hours in the day to do central planning. It sounds to me like you're using the word entrepreneur, but really you're talking about customer service in the end. It's the idea of I'm going to look at my staff, how can they serve Mm -hmm. the rest of the agency or the mission areas, which is something I'm seeing quite a bit across a lot of CIOs is that move to say, we're not just doing IT, we're we're doing mission and IT is supportive of it. You're shaking your head and people can't see that right now. But so that obviously must be on the right track. Yes, I think it is. You're very much on the right track. And I think the trends that we're seeing is that really what we should be thinking about is end-to-end services, because... If you fragment IT, you might do one part great. You might get the software great, but you don't think about how you're going to host it on the network. You might get the network great. So it's how do you do the functions that need to be centralized, which could be network operations, which could be security, but then also have that end-to-end service representation to the different units, in this case the bureaus and offices of the FCC, and and think of it as actually a partnership. It is service. I'm a big fan of servanthood leadership, but it's also a partnership because if you think about it, at least at the FCC, everything we do has a digital component, and it actually can hopefully make the things we do better. It changes the art of the possible. And so having that view that it's not a subordinate relationship in either way, but it really is truly a partnership, that's what I'm trying to get at with the entrepreneur concept. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to get back, jump into some priorities, which I think you gave us a little bit of a heads up on. You're listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jason Miller. My special guest today is David Bray, the FCC Chief Information Officer. Get empowered with the IT skills you need to improve performance and help your agency achieve its goals. LearningTree is the number one provider of IT classroom training to the federal government. LearningTree is on GSA IT70 and Mobis 874 schedules, which means all levels of the government and qualified contractors get the best tuition savings possible. Plus, for a limited time, government employees can enter to win a free course and a free course for a colleague. Simply visit their website today at learningtree.com CIO. Great news for the Beltways. Save on travel costs and commuting time by attending live, hands-on, instructor-led courses at one of 13 new Learning Tree centers, conveniently located around the Washington-Baltimore area in Columbia, Manassas, Frederick, Stafford Quantico, D.C. Metro Center, and more. Helping you achieve your agency's mission is Learning Tree's number one priority. 
Act now to win a free course for you and a colleague. Go to learningtree.com slash CIO. That's learningtree.com slash CIO. Welcome back. You're listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jason Miller. My special guest today is David Bray, the Federal Communication Commission's Chief Information Officer. Now, David, before break, we were talking about kind of how you ended up here at the FCC. But now that you're here, what are you going to work on? What's your priorities? What are you hoping to get done over the next six or nine months? I've been sort of, again, engaging the different bureaus and offices, engaging the IT team, again, with the best belief that one seeks to understand before they seek to be understood. And what sort of has floated up to the top are really sort of six priorities. The first one is, as, as we were sort of talking about earlier, having that sort of dedicated IT liaison, that dedicated entrepreneur that can actually work with the bureau and offices and that's empowered to take care of end-to-end their IT services. Uh, the second one is actually having what I might call complete transparency in our IT budget and actually sort of demystifying what's being spent for the different bureaus and offices. Uh, and with that, actually trying to work to some sense of approximate normalized cost as to how much we're spending on desktops versus printers versus other services were provided, different projects, how much it costs to actually maintain their legacy systems. And so what I'm trying to do is actually create a choice architecture that the different bureaus and offices can decide the different trade-offs they want to do. Do they want to spend more on mobile devices versus desktops? Do they want to have individual printers, which, you know, we're trying to shift to network printers, but if they have a reason why, maybe they're in different sites, they can choose that. And it's actually their choice, not my choice. I'm empowering that. The third thing is actually to move towards actually true virtual desktop, true bring your own device to work. We're rolling out virtual desktop ideally in the spring. Uh, We're in beta testing right now. And then from that, actually consider our sort of bring your own device policy for the FCC. So that actually, that then empowers people again to actually rethink workflows. Do we necessarily need to always have people on site? Can we be working elsewhere? Some of the things we do involve certain cars. Can we have cars that are actually equipped with the mobile devices that we bring as opposed to actually building them into the cars? So it's sort of empowering what we can do with workflow. The fourth one, as I mentioned, I have the joy of uh, 200 different systems for a group of less than 1,800 people. So it's almost one system for every nine pe- person. Almost kind of feel like Oprah Winfrey. Everyone gets a system. But with that, sort of the idea that we actually want to start thinking about how can we do modular design? How can we actually create modular updates to our systems and do it so that they're interconnected. For example, we don't have to always create a different way of doing user authentication. I could write one module, ideally have that code be open source, reuse it across the FCC, and then if other agencies are using the same software stack as we are, they could also use that code. Same thing for export to PDF. And with that sort of abstract, because right now we have a lot of systems where the store procedures are actually in the database itself, abstract the database from the business code and abstract the business code from the UI, because as we know, we're already moving to responsive user interfaces. In the future, who knows what else it will be, but that we can update the user interface without having to change the business code uh, and work towards the data mark. So that's the fourth thing. The fifth one is really the idea of taking the idea from DevOps, uh, that you actually want to have tightly coupled development and operations, but also sort of put on that sort of the idea that really concepts meet DevOps. And so as we are actually are understanding the workflows, in fact, we're already doing this right now with one of our bureaus, sort of do their storyboard of their workflow and then try and figure out where can we bake in the ability to have security, bake in the ability to have privacy protections from the beginning with those workflows. And so it's not something you bolt on afterwards, but when you do the workflows, that's baked in. And then sort of pursue that in a module of, okay, well, we build this module quickly, get it so it actually de- defines and behaves it actually as we expect it, roll that out, do the next module that meets in the workflow and roll that out. And then a sixth one is really, again, just trying to help with the challenge of that we are at one half, one third staff of where we need to be relative to other government agencies, try and help the FCC staff actually be able to go home at a reasonable hour, because right now they're not. Trust me, I see people doing 12 or 13 hour days on a daily basis. That's sustainable up to a while, but you know, at a certain time, I, I don't want to burn out the team, and actually be able to actually lift up and actually have a role where we're, we're thinking strategically about IT, not just meeting the day-to-day, but actually thinking strategically about cybersecurity, how do we actually ensure privacy protections for the public with communications, and sort of serve as that what I would call digital diplomat role. We've talked a little bit about the uh, dedicated IT liaisons. One follow-up question around that is, are they in place yet? Is it part of it? We have a few in place, and we're going to build the team, because as you said, your workforce is short, maybe a third to a half compared to other agencies your size. What's your plan around getting those IT liaisons in place? We have some of them in place already. They're actually existing employees that have, in a sense, volunteered. In fact, I personally have the goal of not putting anyone in a position unless they want to take it on. The good news is there's a lot of people that have that excitement. We have begun the conversations with the union just to make sure the union buys in too. And in fact, we'll have an all-team meeting later this uh, month 
We just had the new chairman come on board, and as far as, far as the signs say, he seems to be thinking the same thing about empowerment, empowering networks. And so uh, I would expect that by the end of this month. Are there any models you're looking at? For instance, I, I know at the Veterans Affairs Department, for example, they put together these customer service organizations kind of a, from a on a vertical plane. Are you looking at something similar, or is yours going to be more horizontal, somebody who will do all telecom, somebody who will do all database type things? Yeah, so it's definitely the idea that the bureaus and offices are verticals. And what this is, is this is your one end-to-end service that will then interface with the other services we have here, whether it be network, whether it be telecom, whether it be security or everything like that, and make it happen. It's actually something that I tried when I was with the Centers for Disease Control. I actually was a division director for HIV AIDS. And we had, again, we had a similar situation where it was 10 different branches that had not been used to working together made the same proposal then. At the time, I called them business analysts. This was back in 2003, 2004. And the interesting thing there was eight of the 10 branches welcomed it, got it. Two of them resisted it. They said, well, why are we getting an IT person? I want to get an epidemiologist. I want to get a laboratorian. And it took some coaxing. One of them actually foia me because they thought I was too young for the position. So that was fun. But after about a year and a half, two years, sort of the holdouts, one of the most resistant ones actually came back and said it was the best thing that ever happened to their branch. And so I think that's part of the trick with leadership is you have to figure out what's your strategy for bringing on those that might be resistant to change. So if I'm doing leadership beyond just management, management is just meeting expectations. Leadership is actually stepping out of that and potentially incurring friction. My strategy is to try and bring everyone on so that we can actually manage that friction and survive this transformation we want to do. The other thing you talked about next was the transparency in IT budget. And I think it's a fascinating concept for government to say, here's your budget, choose how you spend it based on this architecture. Right. Can you go into that a little bit more? How do you get people used to that idea of, okay, I have choices? And actually, and I have to give credit where credit is due, that actually came from a Kennedy School course that I recently attended. The idea that sort of empowering choice architectures, you know, we do this on a daily basis. You can make choices as to what meals you eat, but there obviously are going to be consequences. And so my goal was not to do central planning, one, because I don't, I have to go at home at night eventually. Uh, my wife does want to see me. And I think it's actually the branches and the offices know better what they need. And so by actually sort of making the budget transparent, one, that makes things more trusting as opposed to being seen as a source of power. And two, they can actually see the challenges that we face, which is right now, if you're spending a lot on personal printers, that removes any ability to spend on things and other things. And now with network printers, maybe you don't need personal printers. With the advent of bringing your own devices, we may actually say, well, does everyone need a desktop? Or can we go to laptops and tablets? And then basically, whenever you walk by the nearest network printer, you could actually print there as opposed to having something on your desk. But I'm a big believer that, if, that the best leaders sell, don't tell. And so this is me trying not to force change on people, but actually bring them along as a coalition. And the idea with a choice architecture, and maybe I'm reading too much into the word architecture, but the idea is here's the standards we're going to use. And this is the one, if you do change, for instance, let's use desktops as an example. If you're going to refresh your desktops, here's the desktop standard you must use. But no one's telling you you have to spend money on this new desktop. You may say we're going to do our refresh cycle in in six months or a year or two years. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What it is is providing them almost like a cost schedule that says here are the different things you can pick from. Here's the cost both to purchase it initially and actually maintain it over a three-year life cycle. And from that, here are the standards we're using so that you're actually interoperable within our organization. But again, it's me trying to empower the bureaus and offices, uh, and they'll know what's best for them. You said you had a meeting when you first got here. Did this come up during that meeting with the bureaus and offices, or is this was that too early on, and this is kind of your thinking has developed? Because I'd be interested to see what their reaction is already, because I'm sure their eyes would be wide and going, okay, you're going to give us choices? Like, like a kid, when they first get the choice, they're kind of like... I can choose the cookie or the brownie? Yes, exactly. It is exactly that. And in fact, we we will have to watch and see what happens. There may be ones that choose to go for the four or five brownies, and then they don't have anything left over for the vegetables they also need to eat. But again, that's part of the learning process, and so we'll see what happens. But so far, when I've been talking to different bureaus and offices, it's been very receptive. And I think it's the way we have to go, because especially if we go to bring your own device to work, it's all about empowering the end user. All right, and we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about BYOD and VDI a lot of the good acronyms in the government. You're listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jason Miller. My special guest today is David Bray, the Federal Communication Commission's Chief Information Officer. Get empowered with the IT skills you need to improve performance and help your agency achieve its goals. Learning Tree is the number one provider of IT classroom training to the federal government. Learning Tree is on GSA IT70 and Mobis 874 schedules, which means all levels of the government and qualified contractors get the best tuition savings possible. Plus, for a limited time, government employees can enter to win a free course and a free course for a colleague. Simply visit their website today at learningtree.com/cio. 
Great news for the Beltways. Save on travel costs and commuting time by attending live, hands-on, instructor-led courses at one of 13 new Learning Tree Centers. Conveniently located around the Washington-Baltimore area in Columbia, Manassas, Frederick, Stafford Quantico, D.C. Metro Center, and more. Helping you achieve your agency's mission is Learning Tree's number one priority. Act now to win a free course for you and a colleague. Go to learningtree.com slash CIO. That's learningtree.com slash CIO. Welcome back. You're listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jason Miller. My special guest today is David Bray, the Federal Communication Commission's Chief Information Officer. Now, David, before break, we're talking a lot about your priorities. We talked about the move to the IT liaison. We talked about the, the idea of choice budget, which is just, again, a fascinating concept. I think other CIOs should maybe pay attention a little. The other one you did was more traditional, VDI, virtual desktop interface, and bring your own device kind of connected there. Let's talk about the VDI first. You're hoping for a rollout in the spring. You're doing a pilot now. Talk a little bit about the pilot. How many people, how are you doing it? What we're doing with VDI right now is a pilot that's uh, in the beta phase. We've got probably about 150 people participating in it. And what we're trying to do is use VMware to actually uh, allow us to do virtual desktop. And, of course, one of the things we're already starting to think about is when you do the virtual desktop and you have that secure kernel, how are things that if people want on their devices to come into the the environment, how are they going to come in? And so one of the things that we're beginning to think about is, is there a way we can have a one-way file transfer uh, where people could actually sort of go to a site, drag in a file, that file then is, you know, scrutinized, sanitized, and if it's sanitized, uh, eventually show up on their desktop. And so you could allow things to come into the environment, even though you have secure kernels. We've also been using, I guess, for the last uh, three or four months, we've also been using Good, which I think is a good sort of interim step to begin to educate the users, because obviously there is a learning curve for the virtual desktop. Uh, you know, you can tell people it's going to be your desktop, but there's obviously some things to be learned there. And really what we're going to try and do is bring it to them as soon as possible because everything I've heard from everybody here is the FCC needs the ability to tell work. You would think it would have it already, but uh, we'll bring them into the 21st century as soon as possible. So previously, without the VDI, was there kind of a VPN where people could, if you're at home and you need to log on to your network, or there was no access, maybe you had webmail access and that's about it? Yes, it was webmail access, and then a very few people had VPN. But uh, as far as I can tell, it's something that a lot of people are clamoring for, and I'm trying to do the best I can, given that I've only been here for about 60 days, to try and actually deliver that as soon as possible. From a VDI standpoint, just to walk me through it a little bit, something that would appear maybe on a laptop, or potentially a home computer, depending on security issues, and then you would they would log on and they'd have that secure tunnel back to the network, and that's where they could you know either upload or download files. But at the, at the end of the day, those files then would go back to the network, meaning you see an image of a file versus the complete file. Is that the concept, basically? So what it is is essentially is, yeah, and it can be on a home computer, it can be on a laptop, it could be on a tablet, it could be even on a smartphone, although I don't recommend trying to use your desktop on a smartphone. That may be a little too small. But essentially, it's a secure kernel that by installing it, when you click it, essentially when by maximizing the screen, it looks exactly like you're at the FCC. But files only exist in that kernel. And in fact, we can remotely collapse that kernel if, if you ever have your device stolen or lost. Nothing ever leaves that kernel. Um, so if you are using it on your desktop, by clicking it, you can work as if you're at the FCC desktop, but you can't literally pull something from that kernel onto your own desktop. And that's why we need to think about that one-way file transfer to bring things in and with, with appropriate sanitation measures. And so that way we can have confidence that actually the users actually are protected. And at the same time, it allows us to focus our security resources more on the servers because essentially now everyone's virtual desktop is actually being hosted in the cloud as opposed to actually on their actual machine. Among all these priorities, you haven't talked about cloud much the first time you brought up cloud. Are you guys in a cloud? Are you guys moving to a cloud? Or how does that work? Because the VDI obviously is sometimes the first step toward cloud. So we actually have a a combination of servers that we host here as well as servers we have in the cloud, and they're actually scattered across those 200 different systems. And I guess I should say in that sense it's actually cloud storage as well as cloud web services too, because of course cloud means things to many different people. My own personal goal, and I think it's something that's in keeping with the team, we should get out of the business of hosting infrastructure for ourselves unless it's absolutely necessary, and there may be some mission-critical things that we absolutely have to host. But uh, we do actually have sort of an internal cloud that we've already started to move towards where we do have an FCC Gettysburg location. We also have this location, and so we can actually begin to actually think about sort of redundancies in case there ever is a problem. And eventually you would see some public cloud or some kind of hybrid government-only cloud for you know, FCC.gov is a perfect example. I know a lot of agencies do, or other types of maybe data databases that are publicly available already. Yes, actually, our website is actually already hosted in the cloud, and then the goal is ultimately to try and get data there too. That's part of the strategy of thinking about how can we actually abstract the data 
from the stored business code and several of the different systems we have that are out of date. So that actually that data can be, where possible, either available to the actual users. We do have sites that actually people interact with, either if in the private sector or actual customers. If you ever need to get an FCC um, registration number, what's called an FRN, you come to us and have that actually where you can view the data that's stored that you need to interact with, as well as open data, obviously. Well, we've talked data, we've talked cloud, so the last must be mobile uh, computing because that's the only three things we can talk about as a CIO. So you mentioned BYOD, another another uh, kind of a bit of a buzzword in the government uh, sector here. How are you moving toward bring your own device for mobile? And is it going to be the type of thing where, for instance, at the EEOC, they have an optional BYOD where if you want a government furnished device, we'll give you one. But if you want to use your own, we'll make it work that way too. So we're in the early phases and it's probably linked to when we roll out VDI. Imagine there'll still be discussions. My inclination, again, this is open to everyone else's input, is it will be voluntary. Uh, and it will be an option for people. And then what we can do is provide here, when they're on site, a network they can connect to so that we can actually handle sort of the data. Because a lot of people ask, well, if I bring my own device, how are we going to handle the coverage? Well, if they're here on the network, they can actually connect to the network here. It may not be the actual FCC network. It may be something separate because, again, they're actually using their own device and who knows what else is going in and out of that device. But uh, that still needs to be thought out. In fact, we actually put in for a presidential innovation fellow to actually focus on secure mobile. So hopefully we'll get one. Right now, what's the policy around mobile devices? Is it only government furnished devices and they only are connected to the network? Yes. Uh, right now it's only government devices connected to the network. There is, because we do have the public, there is a guest Wi-Fi for when we have commission meetings. But technically if you're working for the FCC, you should be connecting to the FCC network. Again, you're only here 60 days, so but has there been pilots around iPhones or tablets or iPads or anything of the like? I'm proud to say I have both an iPhone and an iPad as a CIO, and we're using Good right now for that. And on that, I actually do my work on an iPad and iPhone. And I I'm actually seriously thinking about not having a desktop. Throw one more at you. IT budget for 2013, and, and I'm not sure if you know your budget for 2014 because the FCC is one of those agencies that you depend a lot on fees, so maybe there's no appropriation that Congress has to come in. Give me a sense of your IT budget. So there is an appropriation, I and mean, what we had last year was a budget of about $48 million, although there was additional money at the end of the year that was spent above and beyond that. Next year, I think it's really up to the new chairman as to where he wants to go. I would like to make the case that we invest in our people. That's our number one thing because right now everyone's fighting fires and you can only do that for so long. And the other thing that I would like to make the case is that we invest in modernizing our systems. I realize a lot of people are attracted to try and do the shiny because they're seen as quick wins, but they're quick wins that don't last long. My assessment is the systems here at the FCC, they're built on pipes that probably need an update and probably need some good cleaning and modernization. And so use this year to get ready for that, build those relationships, understand the workflows, and then you use the next year to actually try and actually modernize the systems. Unfortunately, we are out of time. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we'll have you back on the show in, in about six months to check up on what's going on. But we're out of time for today. And you've been listening to Ask the CIO on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jason Miller. My special guest today is a very busy David Bray, the Federal Communication Commission's Chief Information Officer. David, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me, Jason.